Good morning to you all. This is Atilla Yeshilada presenting for Real Turkey Channel at 4 a.m. Istanbul time. Today we're going to talk about a global debt crisis which may be beckoning. We may be at the beginning stages of a global debt crisis. What is a global debt crisis? Well, I mean, I don't want to use technical terms in these videos, but remember what happened in 2007, 2008. Uh, the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, which spread all across the world like COVID. Imagine something like that. If 2008 global financial crisis was the Delta variant, this time we're probably talking about the Omicron variant, at least where we stand, it may get worse. Meaning that this is going to be much more contagious, but much less lethal. By the way, of course, you may ask, why is this old guy shooting videos at 4 a.m. in the morning for YouTube? The answer is I just got kicked out of TikTok for indecent behavior, so really I have nothing else to do. And, you know, before I go to sleep again in my drunken stupor, I wanted to do a video and darken your day. Okay, why am I shooting this video when this channel is dedicated to Turkey and events related to Turkey? Well, simply because sometimes to understand Turkey, you have to understand the global backdrop. And this is one of the situations where developments in the global marketplace or the global economy is going to impact severely on Turkey. Why is that so? Well, remember we're talking about a global debt crisis and Turkey is one of the most heavily indebted countries in the world. To be specific, Turkey has to roll over or pay off at least $160 billion worth of foreign debt within the next 12 months, which is something like, what, 22% of its GDP or so. Uh, of course, we need to know what will happen to the global credit and debt markets to determine whether Turkey can raise a new financing or uh, will have to pay off these loans from its own dollar and euro savings, which it doesn't have. So actually, this is the first part of a two-part video series where I'm talking about the global debt developments, and in the second part, I'm going to talk about Turkey. Let me just throw around a few figures to you to understand the gravity of the problem here. A, when people in polite conversations talk about financial markets or markets, they are usually talking about S&P 500 or the Wall Street, but actually the biggest market in the world is the bond market. And that baby has lost $20 trillion of value since the beginning of the year. That's devastating if you, like I, have a retirement account and are nearing your retirement and when you suddenly find out that the net worth of your uh, retirement assets have gone down by 20-30%, which is what happened to me, so unfortunately I will be shooting these videos for the next 10 years to come. Things uh, reached a boiling point when last week one of the most uh, conservative and statist uh, central banks in the world, uh, the UK Bank of England, had to intervene in their government debt market, which is called GILTS in the UK. Bank of England announced a program to buy £65 billion pounds sterling's worth of government bonds to make sure that interest rates, or we call yields, <coughs> on these bonds don't shoot any any higher. Why? Simply because a lot of mortgages in UK are set in flexible interest rates, and when these are reset, uh, the average uh, debtor on her house will find out, for instance, that her monthly mortgage payments have risen from £100 to £250, which, of course, is not good for politics or social peace. Also, as I've said, just like the rest of the developed world, the uh, United States is a huge retirement uh, fund industry, uh, and most of these retirement funds, roughly 60% of their assets is some kind of government bonds or private bonds, and 
they were charking up daily losses as guilt rates continued to increase. So it intervened. That probably made it to the global headlines, or at least, you know, to YouTube. There were dozens of videos about it, but that's not all. I mean, if you read Bloomberg.com, you would see new headlines about Italian debt possibly experiencing a crisis. People's Bank of China is getting ready uh, to defend the yuan, which is dropping rapidly against the dollar. All of these things, of course, suggest that something very fishy is going to old hands like me. I've been in this market for 30 years. My career started with a mini crisis in Turkey because Saddam invaded Kuwait. Does anyone remember that? And then I've seen the tequila crisis, the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, the great crisis of 2001 in Turkey, which was a banking crisis, and then, of course, 2007, 2008, the great financial crisis. Um, why is all of this happening? Very simple. Because after the pandemic, the sudden explosion in demand, coupled with energy prices and food prices rising, mostly as a result of the Ukraine war, has increased inflation. And central banks are mandated with lowering inflation or keeping it steady at a level of 2%, sometimes 3%. In the United States, inflation is something like 9%. In Eurozone, it's like 10%. In Turkey, it's about 80%. But across the world, it's believed the average is something like 8%, far above what the society or the central banks would consider an acceptable rate of inflation. So Fed is raising interest rates, which we call monetary tightening. Uh, European Central Bank, Bank of England, are raising interest rates. In essence, except Bank of Japan, Central Bank of Turkey and you know, the Russian Central Bank, for very idiosyncratic reasons. Uh, all the They are not raising interest rates, but all the rest of the world is engaged in a monetary tightening that the World Bank describes <coughs> as the fiercest in the last five decades. Um, interest rates have risen to almost 4%. From almost zero a year before, well, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Interest rates have risen on average by 200 percentage points or, you know, they doubled over a year. And the World Bank study finds that even at these higher interest rates, global core inflation will only decline to 5% in 2023. Again, much higher than the recent historic averages. And of course, much higher than the target that many central banks would feel comfortable with. So the World Bank study projects that the central banks may have to increase interest rates by an additional two percentage points, that is from four to six percent. And if this happens, global growth per capita would slow to 0.5% in 2000. 23. That's essentially a recession. Now, of course, you know, capitalist economies go through these business cycles. Sometimes they have recessions, sometimes they have booms and expansions. The problem is, if the global economy were to slow further, it would come at the worst possible time. A, you can read IMF or uh, UNCTAD, uh, United Nations uh, Development Agency reports, uh, poverty and food shortages, malnutrition is increasing across the world simply because this global recession coincides with huge rises in energy prices as well as in, in food uh, stuff prices, driven largely by Ukraine war, but also by climate change. Harvests are poor almost everywhere. And most of these poor countries are also heavily indebted because of the pandemic, if not for anything else. So they will be hit by a double whammy. Half a billion people won't find enough food. And you may ask, well, I mean, I'm from Australia or I'm from United States. What is it to me? 
a lot of these people migrate to your countries. They're also migrating to my country. So actually, their problem is a global problem. Moreover, um, they can announce a default on their foreign debt, which means they say, well, sorry, I don't have any money to pay off your debt. And these type of events, one or more countries declaring a default on their debt usually leads to something which we call contagion, sort of like an infectious disease. For instance, the African country Z has declared a default. I live in country Turkey, which is hundreds, thousands of miles away from Africa. But it is the same investors who invest both in country Z and in Turkey. And when country Z defaults, the average investor could panic and say, well, Turkey's economic fundamentals don't look so don't look good, so might as well sell my position there. And this is a serious risk because look at the global asset performance table, which I borrowed from Bloomberg. Please don't sue me, sue me. This year, the only thing that gained in value is the dollars and, of course, the global commodity index. But look at bonds and all the other asset classes. This is what we call cross-asset contagion, a picture of which you can see here. Cross-asset contagion means you have a problem in the global debt market. It spreads to global equities market. It spreads to all sorts of financial assets around the world. So, essentially, this is not... Oops, sorry, let me find my face here. This is not only a debt crisis, but it's an overall financial crisis. And the question we're facing here is, is this temporary? Or are we going to have a significant problem, like the great financial crisis of 2008, which is going to leave scars, which in some countries lasted a decade. Furthermore, it caused a domino effect. First, the United States blew up. A few years later, Europe blew up. Then emerging markets blew up. Uh, you know, a sort of a staggered series of events that, you know, spread across the world. A lot depends on... Well, I'm sorry. Let me, you know, go back a couple of steps. Now, in 2020, when that thing, the virus in Wuhan, spread across the world, and first cases were reported in Europe and the United States, financial markets panicked again. But that only lasted a couple of months because global central banks immediately intervened, printing endless amounts of money, extending direct loans to troubled companies which had to shut down, uh, buy government bonds, etc. In a sense, the average central bank was like the emergency ward of a COVID, COVID hospital. They were running left and right, nurses and other physicians, healthcare staff, trying to save patients. That's what they did. So it lasted only a couple of months. And again, this time, if we're lucky, this is a you know, temporary thing. It may not last beyond, say, the first quarter of 2023. What will determine its permanence and the amount of damage to be caused your country, to my country, to everyone on this planet, is whether two major central banks, Fed and the European Central Bank, will pursue tighter monetary policy. Now remember, going back to the World Bank report, it says, well, you know, if global central banks wish to suppress inflation to their target of 2%, the amount of rate hikes they have initiated this year is not sufficient. They'll have to raise interest rates by another 200 basis points next year. Um, that's scary. That's scary because it means if a country or company has difficulty meeting its liabilities, you know, paying off its loans or credit cards or bonds, then it's not going to do better next year. Now, let me just put this situation to you very clearly. You're a small company. You have taken out some loans for you know expanding your business 
or to buy inputs, and suddenly you see your sales declining. That's a global recession. On the other hand, the bank just said, your loan matured, you can borrow again, but last time you paid 5% interest rate, this time you're going to pay 7%. So you are screwed at both ends. You're not making enough cash to service your debt, and at the same time, the cost of servicing your debt increases. This is a double squeeze. You know, take, take a person. I mean, suppose you're not a white-collar worker, but you work, you know, privately. Um, you're an entrepreneur or uh, you're a small business person, a plumber, for instance, and you have a mortgage loan, which is on a fixed interest rate. On one hand, the value of your house is dropping, which is just a nightmare to start with, simply because, you know, there is a global recession, which is spreading across assets. Two, your revenues from plumbing is not increasing or even decreasing. Three, the monthly payment on your mortgage suddenly doubled. That's a nightmare, and that's, you know, what happened in 2008. And that's what we're facing if major central banks continue to increase interest rates in 2023. Will they? Well, this is an article from Financial Times by a gentleman called uh, Mark Plander, John Plander, I'm sorry, very well-known author on financial affairs. Uh, and he says, you know, he has... Um, a very negative prediction about 2023. He says central banks have prepared a recipe for monetary overkill and liquidity crises. Essentially, what he argues, what a lot of uh, experts on financial affairs argue is, yes, we have an inflation problem, but remember, central banks also have to mind financial stability. And some of them also have to mind employment. And these three goals clash. That's sort of like a version of the impossible trilemma in the economics. In the sense that if you want to reduce inflation, you have to raise interest rates. But when everyone carries huge amounts of debt, as you raise these interest rates, a lot of these people become unable to pay off those debts. So you have a financial stability problem. And, you know, if people are not making money, if companies are not making enough money, they'll be laid off or they'll have to, you know, close down their shops. So you have a triple problem. On one hand, you have increasing unemployment. On the other hand, you have the tremors in financial markets and as importantly in the mortgage market, in the credit market that you have to deal with. But above all, you have this overarching mandate to control inflation. And that's the dilemma central banks are currently struggling with. Uh, it is my opinion, though this is not the consensus opinion, that despite the threat to financial stability, that is to thousands of homeowners going bankrupt, or to thousands of small companies going bankrupt, or a lot of countries becoming unable to pay off their debts, Fed and ECB will persist on increasing their interest rates simply because Fed operates under the harrowing experience of 1980s in the United States. In 1978, I believe, uh, the year I entered, the, arrived in the United States under Carter administration, inflation was like something like 16%. Uh, then uh, a new central bank governor came in, Paul Walker, and he took the hammer to inflation. But the cost was a two-year recession. In 70s, on the other hand, I think Paul Burns was central bank governor in the United States. Uh, inflation was flaring up again because of OPEC supply shops and the cost of sustaining the war in Vietnam. Paul Burns said, there isn't really much I can do, so I'm not going to tighten monetary policy. Uh, I'm going to preserve employment. I'm going to preserve financial stability and let inflation go, go wherever it goes. Looking at these two experiences, the Fed, I think, decided I would rather raise interest rates now and risk a recession because 
if I mind financial stability and start printing money again, or stop raising interest rates, I'll have an inflation problem that may last a decade. And that's a nightmare for the society. Not everyone is heavily indebted. Not everyone has a mortgage outstanding. But everyone is hurt by inflation. The poorest as well as the richest. Fed and ECB are largely immune to political pressure, but around the world, most central banks at least listen to what the government says, listen to what the electorate say. And what they're hearing is, I don't really care what happens to debt. Deal with the inflation problem, because every day the bread I have to buy for my family is becoming less affordable. And that's a nightmare scenario. You can have a scenario where Despite the global recession and several countries or thousands of mortgage owners or thousands of small companies across the world are going belly up. But the central bank, while shedding tears, must continue ruthlessly with with these interest rate hikes. Is this a definite scenario? Are we doomed to that? I mean, is this 2023 going to be the year when we're going to see mushroom clouds, no electricity at homes because there is no natural gas, and the bank knocking at our door to repossess our home, our car, our computer, whatever. It's likely. It's not certain. What might happen to bail the world out? Well, for one thing, the Ukraine war may end one way or other, which would immediately depress energy prices and also inflation. The food scarcity also would ease because both Ukraine and Russia are major suppliers of agricultural commodities and, you know, the climate may turn more favorable that year, next year, improving, you know, uh, improving yields, harvests. Two, of course, there is a huge debate on whether the current tsunami of inflation is permanent, as it was in 1970s, or just a passing phase. It is possible that the average inflation across the globe turns out to be lower than the World Bank predicts. On the other hand, it could be higher. We honestly don't know. I mean, there is just this huge argument that you know the world is naturally set on deflation, that is, on forever falling prices or very low inflation because of technological innovation and globalization. Um, So, you know, we shouldn't really uh, pay so much attention to inflation and focus on financial stability and preserving employment. These are possibilities, of course. Uh, We really don't know. Uh, If you ask my opinion, we're in deep trouble. I don't think any of these things will happen. I've shot a video on the impact of Ukraine war on Turkey where I mentioned my views. I don't think energy prices are going to decline at all, even if there is peace, simply because believing in green transformation, most of the energy companies have not invested into new fields. If the world returns to a normal pace of economic growth, energy prices, such as WTI, crude oil, will shoot over $100 again, simply because there is not enough supply to go around. Thank you very much for watching this very cheerful video. In a few days, I'll be shooting the follow-up, which is the implications of uh, global debt crisis on Turkey and whether Turkey has its own debt problems. Um, I love your comments, Uh, keep commenting, and if you like it, subscribe or, you know, give a thumbs up. Otherwise, just stay warm and build a nuclear shelter. This is Atilaya Shalada saying goodbye from Istanbul.